Welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Language. I am Arkwarma from ID Kanpur and we are on the final lecture of week 5. Week 5, we are talking about sentence processing. In the last lectures, we talked about what is a sentence, we talked about the garden path theory of sentence processing and in the two lectures, we talked about various aspects of the constraint based uh, uh, processing theory of parsing. In today's lecture, we will continue our discussion about the constraint based parsing models and also look at some alternative models of processing uh, or of achieving, uh, you know, successful parsing. So, let us uh, move ahead without uh, wasting a lot of time. Now, one of the things uh, that we discussed while we were talking about constraint based parsing models is that uh, the verb structure kind of, uh, you know, has to be factored in while multiple, uh, you know, uh, structures are being generated. Uh, following that, one of the central claims of the CBP theory uh, is that this structural information is tied to the specific words, not only verbs, but other words as well, but more specifically verbs. So, this structural information is tied to specific words in the lexicon, okay. Let us uh, look into this in more, in a bit more detail. What does this structural information might look like? So, let us look at uh, one possibility is that we might be storing this structural information. Say, for example, for the sentence like Dr. Phil was reading or Dr. Phil was reading the book, Dr. Phil was reading the little girl the book. So, for the verb reading, there might be multiple structural uh, representations possible and what we might be doing is we might be storing these structural representations into our long term memories. So, whenever we come across the word was reading, we can kind of draw the structure from the memory and use it as such in order to speak or to comprehend. So, for a verb like was reading, just to kind of uh, repeat it, for a verb like was reading, long term memory would contain at least three phrase structure trees, intransitive, transitive and ditransitive forms uh, and that basically uh, should look a little bit like this. So, Dr. Phil was reading, this is a simple verb phrase, Dr. Phil was reading the book is the verb phrase 2 and Dr. Phil was reading the girl the book, that is the verb phrase 3. Uh, so, this is the possible structures that you could have in order to store information for the verb was reading. However, this is not the only possibility that uh, the verb posits, it can posit other possibilities as well. Say for example, in the dative form, okay, is that, will that be represented as well? If so, there will be fourth tree. What if the dative form is supplemented by information about the location? So, Dr. Phil was reading the, uh, you know, uh, the girl, the book at a particular location, something else. So, you know, uh, reading the girl, the book at the park, something like that. So, will that also create another structure? So, you will have 14, uh, you know, uh, another structure. Or what if the sentence is even slightly longer? So, something like Dr. Phil was reading the book to the girl at the park next to the fire station that was built by the generous pilgrims from Burkina Faso who like to take long walks with their vicious pet lizards. Now, where do we go from here? How many structures will you generate and how many structures will you store? And if you are going to store so many different structures for a particular verb form, obviously you will kind of get confused and that will be useless. You will not really be able to uh, draw information about a specific structure from the long term memory in order to understand or produce a uh, you know, a particular verb form. So, this is precisely what the problem is. So, you can see the girl was was reading the girl uh, the book to the girl or was reading the book to the girl at the park or say for example, was reading the book to the girl at the park next to the fire station etc. So, you can see that so many structure trees can be added. Now, uh, what is the solution of this kind of a problem? A possible solution might be to know where to stop generating and storing structures, you know, a stop rule. Now, referred to as the leg shaving problem, it kind of offers a way to come at the, you know, to arrive at a particular stop rule and the leg shaving problem is in that sense easy. Suppose say for example, you are a, you know, a female and you are kind of shaving the leg, where do you exactly stop shaving the leg? Maybe just up to the knee. You know, something like that. So, that is just basically arriving at a uh, sort of an, uh, you know, place where you will stop with generating so many structures and storing so many structures in the long term memory or shaving the legs, so to speak, okay. So, this principle kind of tells us that, okay, this is the broad criteria which I will use to stop generating more structures. That is basically what I am concerned with. Now, can we come up with a similar principle for verb related syntactic structures as well? So, for example, for uh, specific word, verbs, all verbs. Now, one possible stop rule for uh, storing syntactic representations 
could be the argument structure hypothesis. What kind of argument structures a particular verb has and on the basis of that you decide when and uh, how many structures you have to store. Let us look into this in a little bit more detail. What is the argument structure hypothesis? The structural information related to a verb's arguments is supposed to be stored in the lexicon. So, a particular the kind of arguments that a verb can have in this structural information can be stored in the mental lexicon and everything else will be computed on the fly. So, structural uh, possibilities this verb has and everything else that kind of comes up will be calculated on the fly as you are writing or reading the sentence. Okay. In this, you will need to do two things. You will need to distinguish between arguments and adjuncts. So, let us understand what the arguments are. Arguments are the linguistic partners that a word must have. So, uh, something that uh, without which the verb cannot, word cannot be expressed, so it must, must have it. And the adjuncts are partners that a word can have but does not really necessarily need. Say, for example, I was sleeping is fine by itself. It can have I was sleeping at the bed, but does not really matter, okay? that kind of a thing. Now, arguments can be thought of as being elements of meaning that a word needs in order to express a complete thought. I cut, Dr. Phil put, what did he put, where did he put that? So, you need some, so those things that will be filled in there will be the arguments of these verbs. Okay. So, uh, elements of meanings that are usually expressed explicitly but can sometimes be omitted as well. Say for example, the verb eating is thought to require an object. It must say I ate, what did you eat is the natural question. It must require an object, but that semantic argument can be omitted from the actual spoken sentence. Say for example, if you are saying Dr. Phil was eating, it does not keep it completely, completely necessary to have that. It might have uh, was eating a banana or a pancake, but if it does not have, really does not really you know break the bones of the sentence. So, that is something you have to uh, remember. Now, uh, if you look at this, you will find that verbs uh, can have between 0 and 4 arguments. Uh, so, for example, verbs like sand, uh, rained and snowed uh, have around 0 arguments. So, it snowed, full stop, no need of another argument. It uh, you know uh, rained, no need for other argument. Sneeze can have one argument. Uh, devoured can have two arguments as in Dr. Phil devoured the sandwich and then you can have three say for example uh, um, that uh, put will have three arguments Dr. Phil put the sandwich on the plate. So, what did he put and where did he put? So, you need three arguments and then four arguments can be there in bet. Say for example, Dr. Phil bet Rush Limbaugh a sandwich that Big Brown uh, would win the Kentucky Derby. What did he bet about and all of that detail needs to come in. Okay. So, uh, the thumb rule is a verb can have anywhere between 0 and 4 arguments. That is what we take from here. Given that a maximum number of arguments is 4, uh, the problem for storing structural uh, representations or possibilities kind of gets a little bit simplified. Now, you can kind of store uh, all these representations instead of uh, having infinite number of these uh, structures, you can have between 1 and 5, you know. That kind of uh, will uh, seal, uh, you know, will kind of seal the problem a little bit. So, in case of a verb like was reading, everything beyond the subject Dr. Phil and the direct object book is optional. So, Dr. Phil was reading the book after every, you know, everything else, Dr. Phil was reading the book to the girl or reading the book to the girl at the park or reading the book to the girl at the park by the fire station, etc., etc., is all optional. What is most necessary is Dr. Phil was reading the book to the girl. These are the two things that need to be remembered. Okay, so, this is the argument, everything else was the adjunct part. Now, the argument structure hypothesis would claim, therefore, that only two structural possibilities would be stored in the long term memory for was reading. And uh, so, when listeners access the verb form was reading, they would activate two associated syntactic structures, one that did not have a place for a post verbal object and one that did. So, Dr. Phil was reading, that will be stored. Dr. Phil was reading the book that will be stored and Dr. Phil was reading the book to the girl or Dr. Phil was reading the book to the girl at the park or Dr. Phil was reading the book to the girl at the park by the fire station and all of those possibilities will not be stored and will be computed on the fly as the sentence keeps coming in. Now, now how could this information be accessed during and used during parsing? Let us look at that. 
according to the constraint based parsing theory in general and the argument structure uh, uh, hypothesis in particular when listeners access the lexical representation of the verb like was reading they immediately activate the associated structural information the two forms that we said are stored the different structural possibilities are then activated to the extent that they have appeared in the past with the verb in question suppose uh, you know, you remember that example you are talking about, uh, you know, a verb coming with a sentence complete and Dr. Phil realized that his goal. So, you know, so those kind of things. On In the past, whether a direct object, object has come or a sentence complement has come or uh, ditransitive two objects have come, those kind of things. Uh, depending on that frequency, things will be activated or evaluated. So, the different structural responsi possibilities are activated to the extent that they have appeared in the past with the verb in question. So, if was reading has most often appeared with a direct and an indirect object, the ditransitive structure will be the one more active than the intransitive structure. If it appeared most often with a direct object, then the structure will be more active, then that structure will be more activated than any of the other stored alternatives. So, the idea is you know broadly how many arguments that a verb kind of comes up with, what are the most common argument that a verb comes with and this kind of solves the problem of storing so many structural possibilities anyways. Now, uh, moving further, the argument structure hypothesis, it provides a somewhat more nuanced view of how arguenthood might be influencing parsing. Let us look at that. Now, according to the argument structure hypothesis, argument frames and their corresponding syntactic structures are important because they determine how some of the elements of the sentences would be interpreted. So, argument frames and corresponding syntactic structures will be very important because they will kind of help you interpret the elements of the sentence. This is one. For example, how should a listener interpret a prepositional phrase like to Harry? You know, to Harry what? It could be interpreted as the goal of transforming action as in the bully sent a threatening letter to Harry. But the prepositional phrase could be interpreted instead also as a location. Dr. Phil, uh, you know, the bully stapled a, threatening, stapled a threatening letter to Harry, you know. So, physically in that sense. How would the listener know that this is a location or it is a transferring action uh, thing? Now, how does the listener know uh, how to, in, uh, you know, apply which of the interpretations? Let us look. The argument structure hypothesis uh, contains that the subcategory properties of the verbs determine how the prepositional structure needs to be interpreted. So, this subcategory information can kind of come in here and inform the uh, interpreter or listener which of the uh, structures is more common. So, when the lexical representation of the verb specifies a recipient or a goal argument, then the prep prepositional phrase headed by to will be interpreted as the goal argument. When the verb does not uh, specify a goal argument, then the prepositional phrases headed by to will be interpreted as locations. So, now you have these two conditions. When lexical representation of the verb specifies a, it, when it specifies a recipient or a goal, then it will be, uh, then to will be represented as the goal argument. When it does not specify a goal argument, then it will be represented as locations, okay. I think it is interpreted as uh, transferring action in the first case. Now, consider, let us take an example. Uh, consider the saleswoman tried to interest the man in the wallet or the saleswoman tried to interest the man in his 50s. There are two sentences. In sentence 51, in the wallet is an argument of the verb interested because people have to be interested in something. So, it is a action. Okay, you do not have to sneeze anything, you just have to sneeze. So, that is intransitive. Now, in 52, in his 50s is, is an adjunct of the noun man, okay. So, it is not something that is happening to in his 50s or something. Although we can always think or talk about how old the man is, we do not really have to do that, okay. Just look at this again. The saleswoman tried to interest the man in the wallet. Interest in the wallet, somebody has to be interested in something. So, in the wallet kind of fits in interest. In his 50s, it is not a necessary thing. The man, we can talk about how old a man is, but it is basically an adjunct noun. It is not really a, you know, a necessary relation here. <coughs> According to some accounts of parsing, including the argument structure hypothesis, comprehenders or listeners have a general preference or bias to interpret incoming phases as arguments. So, what people do is generally 
any incoming phrase they kind of try and uh, you know uh, treat that as arguments of the verb so what will happen given this assumptions comprehenders will try to treat both in the wallet and in his 50s as arguments of the verb interested that is one now since wallet meets the makes more sense uh, you know it meets the criteria then in his 50s as something to be interested in comprehenders should take less time in processing the first sentence that is 52 versus the second sentence that is in his 50s indeed when reading times were used to measure processing load comprehenders were able to process sentences like 51 uh, faster than sentences like 52 okay yeah 51 and 52 now so what happens people appear to process argument relations faster than non argument relations so in that sense it kind of tells us that the argument uh, structures are being kind of are being important and are being stored somewhere and people are processing on the basis of argument relations now another evidence uh, that you know, for the fact that an argument status has an influence on parsing uh, could come from studies showing that people infer the missing argument in cases sometimes people kind of if the argument is not provided they infer what the missing argument is so that's that's also done okay so uh, let's take an example uh, consider the difference between the simple past tense verb sank and the very closely related past perfective verb sunk was sunk if somebody says the ship sank there is not need to be an external agent okay there's the ship sank it's it probably you know sank by itself or somebody sunk it we do, we're not really interested however is the and the sentence describes a change of state uh, but the change of state can be also internally caused so we don't really need an external agent here however if somebody says the ship was sunk then it requires an external agent who sunk the ship you need to know that okay so do people process process the sentences like the ship sank differently than the process uh, then they process the sentence like the ship was sunk let us look gail monner and her colleagues uh, showed that actually people process these two sentences differently so uh, when people hear sentences like the ship was sunk that need an agent but don't explicitly provide one comprehenders immediately add or infer an unnamed external agent they kind of make it in their head that okay this guy must have sunk it or god must have sunk it or something something like that so they interpret the sentence with a missing argument as if it said the ship was sunk by somebody they automatically assume that somebody must have sunk it and that somebody could be any x y or z however if the sentence starts the ship sank and then continues to collect the insurance money then uh, comprehenders have a hard time processing the sentence okay then they don't know what to do with this why is this problem coming because the beginning of the sentence the ship sh the ship sank does not require people to infer an agent it does not pose the uh, you know a necessity that you have to have an argument here it can the ship sank should stop there if it is continuing it's probably leading to a little bit of a problem okay so, so there is nothing in the listener's representation of the sentence to connect up with the purpose uh, clause which is to collect the insurance money and stuff now there's no one in the listeners uh, you know there's no sentence in the listeners uh, in mental representation that would serve as the uh, you know person who has this motive of the fraud and has sunk the ship so we don't really know that now this was basically about the argument structure hypothesis i hope at least two points are conveyed that the argument structure information is very important for parsing and we sh uh, we at least saw a couple of examples where it kind of seems that people are either inferring the uh, argument or kind of they're filling up missing arguments you know so those those kind of things now this is uh, you know formally the end of uh, you know the discussion about the constraint based parsing models let us uh, look at some of their limitations as well now uh, it has been found it has been shown that a parser may not always favor likely structures over simpler structures so uh, the argument in the cbp model was that the people would kind of prefer likely structures over simpler structures because likely structures make more sense however in some of the studies it has been shown that sometimes people do prefer simpler structures over more likely structures let us look in this sentence the athlete and the athlete realized her shoes somehow got left on the bus now just look at the sentence the less likely structure is simpler that is you kind of uh, keep uh, the athlete uh, the athlete realizes her shoes in one and somehow got left on the bus as other 
okay but we know uh, realize does not come with a direct object we know that it comes with a sentence complement so the better configuration would be the athlete uh, uh, the athlete realize her shoe somehow get uh, you know got left on the bus that is the correct uh, kind of configuration however eye movement uh, data suggests that subjects still consider the direct object version before dismissing it it's not that they don't evaluate it they do come up with it they do evaluate it and then they dismiss it okay why should this happen now there is this absence also so this is one problem with respect to the cbp kind of explanation the other is that there is also an absence of evidence that sentences with simpler structures are harder to process sometimes we've seen that in some of the examples i think with the context and the you know the burglar blew the safe with a uh, rusty lock those kind of examples we kind of saw that the simpler structures seemed more difficult to process but it has been shown via experiments that that may not be the case all the time suppose remember according to cbp the right kind of story context helps a person comprehend uh, you know this particular sentence you know it assigns more activation to or activation to a more complex syntactic structure because with the context it seemingly supposed to be easy to understand now no such evidence has actually been found so people have kind of you know not really compared the two and uh, found that one is easier or more difficult than the other so here also the cbp claim does not really hold a lot of water the final problem with the cbp accounts is that there is no uh, real simple easy way to test the influence of so many of these information that the cbp accounts talk about so visual context cross linguistic influences prosodical context uh, you know uh, uh, yeah verb st uh, structure information uh, frequency all of those kind of things that we've been talking about in the last two lectures there's no easy way to test these things out and so the testability is not really very clear and because the testability is not really very clear you cannot be 100% sure of okay this must have been the case okay so this is this is something uh, if you kind of talk about uh, the problems with the uh, cbp account although my uh, uh, personal opinion is that they're still kind of doing a better job as compared to you know the garden path kind of theory but okay that's uh, something to uh, you know uh, contend with learn more about now so we've talked about two kinds of parsing theories we've talked about uh, frazier's garden path theory and we've talked about the family of constraint based parsing models there are some of the other th some other theories as well which have talked about parsing in slightly more different ways so let us look at some of those theories now one of the first theories i could talk to you about is the construal based parsing theory the construal based parsing theory is essentially a refinement of the classical garden path theory which was given by frazier and Cl clifton in 1996 now construal basically retains the idea that parsing occurs in discrete stages but it kind of adopts adopts the idea that context can influence uh, which structure the parser would prefer and the idea that the parser can sometimes build multiple structures simultaneously see these were the two things that the garden path theory was not taken into account they were building each structure at one at a time and they were kind of not really taking into account context or similar information however Construal theory kind of adopts these two things on the top of the discrete stage processing that uh, garden path theory was offering. However, construal differs from the average constraint based account in that there are limited set of circumstances under which a parser will respond to contextual information or build parallelly uh, you know uh, parallel uh, syntax structures. So even though this uh, model allows for uh, both of these things, it says that there should be a particular criteria wherein contextual information will be taken up or there will be a particular criteria where you can start generating parallel multiple parallel structures so that is where the construal based theory uh, differs from the cbp kind of model and uh, earlier we talked uh, we talked about how does it kind of uh, incorporate some of the things uh, in the uh, older gpt kind of model okay now most of the time what the construal based parser would do is it will behave pretty much like the garden path parser in fact it will even use the same the three uh, heuristics that we talked about now how does the parser decide which strategy to use the construal based uh, uh, parsing strategy says that dependencies between words can come in two flavors 
primary relations and non-primary relations. What we have to actually figure out is what are these two kinds of relations. Now, the primary relations basically they are said to correspond roughly to argument relations as we have defined earlier and non-primary relations are everything else. So, uh, primary relations are the things that are needed, argument based relations and non-primary relations is all the adjunct things that you can add to it. Okay. So, all other things being equal, the parser would prefer to treat the incoming material as though it represents a primary relation. When the parser interprets an incoming word or a set of words as representing a primary relation, it makes its structural decision based on the standard garden path processing heuristic. However, if the incoming material cannot be interpreted as reflecting a primary relation, the parser will adopt a different strategy to deal with the material. So, the idea is the um, interpreter is kind of looking for whether there are primary relations in the incoming input or not. If there are primary relations, then it goes typically by the garden path rule. If they are not, then a different strategy needs to be adopted. Now, in the first stage, the parser will affiliate the incoming material to the preceding sentence context, you know, applying late closure sort of things. It will kind of affiliate whatever incoming is to the earlier sentence context. Okay. During this stage, the parser will simultaneously also consider all possible attachment sites for the incoming material, where all you can kind of attach this. Effectively, in that sense, building multiple syntactic structures simultaneously. So, that is happening. Now, during a following stage of processing, in the next stage of processing, once this has been done, the parser will evaluate the different structural possibilities in the light of the story context, sentence level meaning and also other non-syntactic sources of information. So, here is where the uh, garden path uh, theory kind of, you know, uh, adopts a lot of the CBP kind of uh, mechanism. So, uh, story context, sentence level meaning, other kind of non-syntactic sources of information. To explore the, how the con uh, control based parser works, let us con uh, consider these sentences. The daughter of the colonel who had a black dress left the party. The daughter of the colonel who had a black moustache left the party. So, you have two sentences, 55 and 56. 55 is the daughter of the colonel who had a black dress left the party and 56 is the daughter of the colonel who had a black moustache left the party. Let us see. In 55, people will generally interpret the relative clause who had a black dress as going with the daughter rather than the colonel. In 56, they would interpret the relative clause who had a black moustache as going with the colonel rather than with the daughter. If listeners apply the late closure heuristic to parse 55 and 56, they should have uh, an easier time processing 55 because had a black dress kind of gets to uh, you know the daughter, whereas 56 will not be able to you know, will not be able to attach that to the daughter if you kind of go with the late closure. But the constitutional account says that who had a black dress and who had a moustache are adjuncts of the preceding noun, you know and so present non-primary relations. So, they are not primary relations, so they have to be treated slightly differently. Under these conditions, the parcel would affi affiliate the relative clause to the preceding context and simultaneously looks for every place that the relative clause could be attached. Okay. In 55 and 56, therefore, there are two possible hosts for the relative clause. It could either be the daughter or it could be the kernel. In 55, the daughter related structure works very well given the meanings of all the words involved. Obviously, a daughter can have a black dress and in 56 and even the kernel can have a black dress. So, that is all right. In 56, the kernel related structure would work well. The moustache to the uh, daughter does not really work. So, that can be rejected. So, when it comes to evaluate the different structural possibilities, there is always one of the good ones. So, one is one seems usually more plausible than the other. Let us say uh, like that. As a result, the construal account predicts no difference in the difficulties between 55 and 56 and this is exactly the pattern that was found when participants reading times were compared on reading these two sentences. Okay. So, this is how the construal based, parking, uh, construal based parsing works and kind of you know demonstrates that it is sort of uh, improved version of the GPT model taking up some uh, uh, characteristics from the CBP approach. Now, the other uh, 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 method of parsing that I wanted to talk about is the race based parsing method. Now, the race based parsing method stipulates that a parser can build multiple syntactic structures in parallel and this could be seen as a refinement to the CBP approach to parsing. Now, according to this account, parsing shall occur in two stages. In the first stage of processing, 
all structures that are licensed by a grammar get activation from the input. It's almost like a you know neural network trace kind of a model, machine learning kind of a thing. So multiple structures can be generated all in parallel as far as the it, they are permitted by grammar. Rather than then competing for a fixed pool of activation, the syntactic structures will compete against each other. So they're not sharing activation from a big pool, they are just competing against each other, kind of you know trying to push each other off. So the first structure to exceed some minimal threshold amount is taken to represent the input and that structure is then used as the basis for the semantic interpretation. So multiple structures are generated, one structure kind of wins the battle, that becomes the base for uh, analyzing the input and then kind of is used as the base for the semantic interpretation. Let's take this example. The brother of the colonel who had a black moustache left the party. Now, while the readers did not have a preference in 55 or 56, in 57, this sentence, it does not really matter which structure gets to the threshold first because both the brother and the colonel can have a black moustache. So the RBP account says 55 and 56. For 55 and 56, the winning structure will lead to a weird interpretation about half the time. Obviously, uh, half the time the dress is given to the colonel or the moustache is given to the daughter. That kind of leads to a slightly weird interpretation. So readers will need to reanalyze their initial structure and semantic interpretation. Hence, 55 and 56 will be slightly more difficult. However, 57, uh, say for example, the control base account uh, says that all should be equally easy. Okay. So 55 and 56 says that 55 and 56 will be difficult. 57, uh, control base account says all three are easier. RBP, however, says 57 will be easier than 55 and 56 as both accounts will be valid. Let us see. Now, uh, okay, so that is that is what the RBP says. Uh, moving on, let us take some other sentences, 58, 59 and 60, which are, this morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. This morning I shot an elephant with great big tusks. This morning I shot a poacher with a rifle. Okay, as earlier here, the RBP account says 60 will be the easiest. This morning, I shot a poacher with a rifle. Kind of makes a little bit more sense as compared to the other two. The RBP and the CPP allow multiple structures and uh, to be generated, but in CPP accounts, the competing uh, the competing structures either would try to inhibit with or interfere with one another. But in RBP accounts, they increase or decrease the activation based on cues from the incoming input there is evidence of competition based accounts. So in that sense, uh, you would say that the race based parsing account will kind of fit a little bit more closely as compared to the construal based parsing account. Now moving on, uh, let's look at some other sentences. I read the bodyguard of the governor retiring after the troubles is very rich. I read quite recently that the governor residing, uh, retiring after troubles is very rich. So two sentences. Uh, in 61, both possible attachment, retiring after the troubles, bodyguard could also be retiring or the governor could also be, also be retiring. Uh, both can be valid 50% of the time. In 62, only one possibility is uh, one is valid, that is the governor retiring after troubles is very rich. Now, if the syntactic structures were to be activated in parallel and if they compete, 61 should be difficult because it's 50-50. However, eye movement uh, studies show that 61 was just as easy as 62 and hence there was no real competition here, okay. So again, the evidence is kind of uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, here and there uh, with respect to all of these accounts. Now, uh, let's look at uh, 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 even more different account of parsing. So, uh, this is called good enough parsing, kind of is uh, uh, put forward by Fernanda Ferreira, one of the leading researchers in psycholinguistics, understanding sentence comprehension and stuff, and he asks, what good is parsing anyway? Do we really need parsing at all? Do we really do parsing? You know? So the idea is what they're trying to say is sometimes we might not need parsing at all. Sometimes we might not really be doing a lot of parsing uh, knowingly. Okay. So sometimes we might not need parsing at all. The uh, lexical semantic information that is the understanding of the words uh, it, that are in the sentence might already be sufficient so that we don't really need to do any parsing anyways. Let us look at the example. The mouse was eaten by the cheese, the cheese ate the mouse, the mouse ate the cheese. You see do these three sentences, 63, 64, 65. The mouse was eaten by the cheese, the cheese ate the mouse, the mouse ate the cheese. 
three sentences. Now, while readers might struggle with the syntax in 63 and 64, if they only use lexico semantic inform, uh, uh, you know, while the readers might struggle with the syntax in 63 and 64, because the syntax kind of can lead them awry. However, if they only use lexico semantic information, 65 should be easily called up. You know, 65 is something that you know which is the correct sentence. The mouse can eat the cheese, the cheese cannot eat the mouse. Okay. So, that kind of argument we might. So, the argument here is that as long as you are understanding the meaning of the words involved in the sentence, you do not really need to do parsing. You do not really need to uh, struggle with multiple syntactic structures and their competition and their structural possibilities and so on and so forth. As long as you are understanding what each of the words are meaning in these sentences, that should be enough. That could that will do the job, that will complete the efficient communication and you do not really need parsing per se. Okay. That is the whole point of this good enough parsing thing. Now, this suggests that people may not always compute syntactic relations between, so the, the last three sentences, it suggests that people may not always compute syntactic relations between words and sentences or that when syntax and lexical levels disagree, people prefer to base their interpretation on default lexical semantic relations. So, more often than not, people will go with the meaning parts of it rather than the syntactic grammatical choices. Okay. So, this is a very interesting outcome after we have kind of uh, you know read so much about parsing. Now, either outcome would go against standard assumptions about how sentences are interpreted that people look up words in the mental lexicon, structure the input, use semantic rules to assign a standard meaning to the syntax. So, this is kind of you know it, this kind of approach does not fit in with any of the other parsing accounts that we have talked about. Okay. Further, uh, there is evidence that people fail to const when people fail to construct correct structures for some sentences and that could come from sentences like while the hunter was talking the deer drank from the puddle. Now, this is the whole sentence I have not given any pauses or anything, but just look at this. If participants parse this sentence correctly, the sentence should not mean the hunter was talking the deer. Okay. If they uh, kind of go completely by grammatical relation, so while the hunter was talking, the deer drank from the puddle. So, it kind of does not connect the deer and stalking in one phrase. But when participants were asked directly after reading the sentence, was the hunter stalking the deer, they would most likely say yes. Even though if you do a syntactic analysis of the sentence on the multiple structural possibilities and so on, you will not be able to link stalking with the deer. However, if you ask people, they will say yes, 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 the hunter was stalking the deer. They are kind of just you know, understanding the meaning of whatever is involved. There is a hunter, there is a deer, obviously the hunter is talking the deer, that kind of thing. Now, that is the result, you know, the hunter is talking the deer and people saying yes, that is the result that one would expect if readers left the deer attached as the direct object of was talking, but that structure is not licensed by the grammar. That structure is not plausible within how, you know, the grammatical structure uh, building uh, exercise would permit. So, it basically tells us that as long as the lexico semantic uh, understanding is there, as long as people are understanding the meanings of the words involved, they are not really going to bother with the syntactic uh, representations being created. Let us take another example actually. Uh, see 67, while the hunter was talking the deer in the zoo, drank, uh, while the hunter was talking the deer in the zoo, drank from the puddle. This is even more unlikely. So, because it is very highly unlikely that the hunter would stalk an animal in a zoo, the correct syntactic structure should lead participants to an interpretation where the hunter is talking something besides the deer. Okay. Let me show you by way of pause how that is. While the hunter was talking, the deer in the zoo drank from the puddle. So, now it does not make sense. Now, you will not be able to say that the hunter was talking the deer because already this semantic information is there that this is a zoo scenario. Obviously, hunters do not stalk deer in the zoo, it is prohibited, it is illegal. So, then the interpretation of what the hunter was talking will be something else than the deer as permitted by syntax. So, nevertheless, when participants in the study were asked the same question here, they still answered, uh, you know, was the hunter talking the deer? They still, they were likely to respond, yes. Now, how is that happening? According to the good enough passing hypothesis, comprehenders uh, set a threshold for understanding. They kind of said, okay, this is how far I will understand. If the community, if the communicative context is high stakes and getting the meaning right is really important, 
comprehenders will allocate sufficient resources to building syntactic structures licensed by the grammar. Did you get it? So, if the community con communicative context is high stakes, you are having a formal conversation, you are in an interview, you are reading for an exam, there is where you will kind of you know try and go by the rule, try and go by the book, generate as many uh, you know uh, syntactic structures that are needed and kind of go with that. However, uh, in those cases also additionally where the comprehender initially builds a, fact, uh, a faulty or a incorrect syntactic structure, they will undertake the processes necessary to revise that structure and they will do all of that as necessary. However, in most experimental contexts, the stakes are very low, you are not losing anything. Nobody is going to fine you or penalize you or punish you if you do not understand the correct sentences. So, what happens there is there are no consequences for failing to interpret correctly. Okay? And the sentences obviously also tend to be quite tricky and abstract and refer to little or you know very little real uh, world like things. So, under those conditions what might be happening is people just do enough syntactic uh, processing to come up with some meaning and they will throw that meaning, they will go with that meaning. Okay. So, if the syntax is tricky in sentences like 66 and 67, the hunter uh, you know, and the deer sentences and the participants threshold for feeling is like they understand is low, then they may not recognize that there is a problem with the syntax either because they are not actually parsing the input which is alright or because they are satisfied with whatever they have gotten out of it. So, in sentence number 67, this one, while the hunter was talking the deer in the zoo drank uh, from the puddle, even though kind of you know uh, the syntax uh, does not permit it and there is enough uh, semantic evidence that you know the hunter could not be uh, stalking the deer in the zoo, they do not really you know pay a lot of attention to this. What they basically do is uh, uh, you know they kind of go ahead with uh, just getting a rough sense of meaning and answering okay hunter hai, uh, uh, deer hai, uh, obviously the hunter must be stalking the deer irrespective of whether it is a zoo or a forest okay that that kind of thing or so that is that is something further on uh, on top of the inability to or reluctance to build the syntactic structures listeners may be sometimes unwilling to abandon an interpretation just because the interpretation is not supported by a license parse so, you kind of make up your mind, this is how I understand the sentence, grammatical, not grammatical does not matter. So, they show this reluctance to abandon a particular structure as they have understood it and that can be actually seen. For, ex for example, when participants, uh, you know, it appears that in the, uh, that participants in the garden path experiments uh, stick with their initial semantic representations while simultaneously showing signs that they are undertaking syntactic revisions at least some of the time. So, even though they are doing the semantic revisions and everything, even though they are doing their own semantic interpretations and everything, they kind of still stick to their uh, initial semantic representation. Even though they are evaluating these multiple syntactic structures, more often than not these participants stick with their initial semantic representations. Now, for example, the participants did persist in thinking that the hunter was talking the deer in both sentences 66 and 67, in the zoo or in the forest, even though the correct, correct parse, especially of at least sentence 67 would have ruled out that kind of interpretation. Okay. So, that is, uh, uh, that is slightly interesting about how parsing seems to be, uh, you know, working out here. Now, uh, experimental evidence uh, also suggests that comprehenders are less likely to uh, successfully revise an initial interpretation with a change in syntactic structure, uh, you know, that entails a change in meaning. So, it has also been shown, experimental evidence also suggests that comprehenders are less likely to uh, successfully revise an initial interpretation when a change in the syntactic structure, you know, warrants a change in meaning. They still would not do that. So, participants usually they will appear to maintain the initial syntactic commitments when uh, challenging a syntactic structure would involve changes in the same. So, for example, uh, I uh, generated this structure, let me just simplify what I am saying here. If I gener if I am reading a sentence, I generated an initial syntactic structure that sort of made sense to me. Now, if somebody is presenting me more information to change this. And in changing this, I will have to change the meaning as well and my understanding of the sentence as well, I will be reluctant to do so. I will stick with my initial syntactic commitments and I will go with it in spite of whatever evidence is kind of coming up because I do not want to change this so that my understanding, uh, you know, uh, should not change. So, I am kind of 
resisting change in syntactic structures so as to resist, resist change in uh, you know my understanding of this that is what is being said here now one problem in this kind of an account or one problem in distinguishing uh, the good enough parsing account and other alternative accounts is that we need to find a way to tell the difference between an error and a good enough parse you know this is wrong and this is a good enough parse see the good enough parse is basically okay i'll just parse to a point that i can understand the meaning to my satisfaction okay or i am making this erroneous parse so i need to know as a comprehender or as a speaker that okay whether i am going right or i am going wrong do i care about this enough so you need something uh, like that if someone uh, reads a sentence and comes up with a wrong meaning is this because the system is designed to miss parse the sentence or did they have they just make made an error so this is something we need to ask okay that uh, that is not really very well specified within the good enough parsing thing so we'll kind of you know uh, leave this discussion at that maybe we'll kind of pick it up at a later point this brings me to the end of this chapter on sentence parsing uh, let us talk a little bit about some of the take home messages what did we learn we learned that a sentence is a meaningful organization of words that kind of uh, you know is done according to certain rules to give a certain meaning what did we learn mostly is that there is something called parsing is a very strenuous mental activity but we kind of do it and it is a most important aspect of understanding sentences so to speak okay the available evidence suggests that the parser or this uh, mechanism that is helping us organize uh, the structure of the sentence uh, makes use of a variety of wide variety of information very quickly as it is figuring out how words in the sentence relate from each other obviously we saw visual context prosody uh, sentence context verb uh, subcategory information cross linguistic influence structural frequency everything all of that is being used and that is being used on the fly simultaneously in parallel in order to get us to the correct interpretation okay as a result many uh, researchers have adopted some version of the cbp processing framework to explain how parsing seems to be done so there is a lot of a kind of a wide variety of notions about here some of the researchers view syntactic parsing as a result of from the uh, as a result of the operation of distributed neural networks alternative parsing accounts agree that uh, some of the theoretical claims made by the constraint based activates uh, advocates such as uh, simultaneous concentration of multiple structures could be correct but they do not agree on the fact that current neural network models will be able to capture all of these kind of parsing mechanisms but that's that's a different uh, that's a question for a different day basically what we kind of want to understand is that yes it is important to understand how words are organized within a sentence there is a process called parsing that helps us do it that process either kind of operates very simply in the gpt kind of account or it kind of takes in a lot of variety of information as in the cbp model or the construal ba construal based model or the rbp model or we can kind of go with a, with a very uh, you know different attitude and say that no no parsing is not really very very important uh, more often than not we kind of go with the lexico semantic relations obviously sometimes uh, when the stakes are high and so on we might do a little bit of parsing and you know, creating multiple structures and evaluating them that is all about sentence processing that i have to say thank you so much we'll meet in the next week to talk about feeding thank you